Hello and welcome. We look forward to showing you our revolutionary new approach to digital rights management. Before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. I want you to notice there's a Q&A button on your screen. You may have to roll over the little uh, Zoom toolbar in order to see it. Just enter your questions as we go along through the presentation and we'll get to them at the end. Maybe we'll answer some of them in the middle, depending on you know if they align just right with, with some of the topics. Also, if you have any problems with the sound or with the video, just please enter that in the chat window and our team will go and assist you as, as quickly as possible. Now we're thrilled that today in our panel, we've got the two inventors, the people who came up with the idea for this revolutionary uh, new approach to DRM. And they're also leading the, the technical teams, writing the code, doing the QA and meeting with the, the critical customers who are helping them develop this feature. So you've got Victoria Foster, who's Vice President of Product Management, and Yul Bahat, who's the Senior, um, Senior Director of Cybersecurity Engineering for KiteWorks. The agenda is pretty simple. And first we're gonna talk about what DRM is and why legacy DRM has had such slow adoption. Then we'll walk you through how we've revolutionized it, and Yule's even going to do a live demo. So let's jump into the first topic. Yule, can you tell us a little about what DRM is and isn't? Absolutely. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. So uh, when, when we say DRM and people say DRM, they have all sorts of definitions on what it is, and a lot of people have this uh, inkling of, of DRM in, in mighty music or in ebooks or in video games or all of those kinds of, uh, of places where companies want to make sure that nobody's pirating their uh, intellectual property. Um, that is a, a part of what we're talking about when we say about DRM, but that is more about the consumer world of things. Uh, we're mostly here to talk about what we call enterprise DRM. So how to enable how does how do companies and and people who work with sensitive information maybe it's privacy maybe it's business oriented all sorts of of information that should be protected and handled handled carefully and yet for the purposes of con conducting business we need to share that with third party uh, people how do we do that without losing control how do we do that maintaining you know making sure that it only the people that needs to see it see it only the people that needs to get hold of it get hold of it and that it doesn't get away from us thanks you now of course gartner analysts have provided a lot of guidance in this area can you walk us through a little bit about how gartner defines drm at a high level sure so gartner has this this definition of it and it has three major uh, pillars of what an enterprise uh, DRM, digital rights management uh, solution or suite of solutions uh, needs to offer and have. One is persistent data-centric defense, meaning we need to know what it is that we are protecting and that thing needs to be protected along its entire life cycle, whether it's in, in, you know, in rest, in motion, in use, and all of those. It needs to solve security and compliance challenges. And a lot of this is coming from compliance. I mentioned privacy before. Uh, definitely a very, very big uh, thing that is going on in the world right now. We, If we have content that contains PII or private information and we need to share that, we need to make sure it's compl it's done in a compliant way and make sure that we as a company or the proprietary of, of that information are, are safe and secure. And it needs to have clear goals and governance with the idea that we need to know, we need to be able to set policies. We need to be able to say, this is what I allow to have to be done with this content. This is who I allow to use this content. And keyword here is governance. I need to be able to track that. I need to be able to make sure that what I wanted to happen actually happened. And yeah. And in order to facilitate all of those, it has to have these three elements. So a cryptographic element, and again, across the entire life cycle. So it needs to be encrypted when it's just in storage. It needs to be encrypted while it's being moved from one place to another. And it needs to be uh, 
protected uh, in use, but that's kind of the caveat. That's where most digital rights uh, solutions in the market today kind of fail. And this is what this is where we uh, a big part of the rev revolution that we're about to present. Second element is the identity. So again, we need to give not only what can be done with it, but who can do it. So the policies that we make need to be very, very specific. That person needs to be authenticated so we can know who they are. And based on that, on that identity, we need to be able to assign policies. Uh, and that, which brings us to the last part, the granular usage and control, meaning that we need to be able to set different policies for different people or different groups of people. And ideally, those policies needs to need to have some context. So if I'm sitting in my home computer, I might not have the same policies or the same permissions that I might have in, in my work laptop. So again, all of those things have to have enough granularity and enough context to make an actual impact. <clears throat> so when we're talking about EDRM, and, and again, this is just maybe to summarize all of this, and this is shared across all the EDRM uh, solutions in the market, which they are plenty and, and have been for the better part of maybe 20 years now. So we need to have a way for an administrator to define um, what it is that we're protecting and what what are the policies that needs to be uh, applied there. It needs to be uh, user initiated. So it needs to happen whenever the user, the other party, you know, the third party, they try to access that file. The EDRM uh, protection needs to apply there. It doesn't matter if they already have it or not. And as I mentioned before, it has to be compliance driven in the sense that it has to make sense in whatever regulatory or standard that we have to adhere to. And in today's world, as we all know, there are many of these types of compliances that we have to adhere to. So you want something, you want a solution that you know, are, is aware of these compliance, of these regulatory uh, regu regulations and standards and help you stay in compliance without having either the administrator or the user have to think about it or know about it specifically. So you that all sounds great. Why do we need a revolution? So as I said, there are many, many solutions in the market today. Uh, but at the end of the day, most of them, not most, if not all of them, are basically doing the same thing, different, impl different implementations of the same idea. So you have a file that needs that again, it's a business file. It's it's a file that that needs to live. It's a file that needs to be used. It cannot just be stored somewhere. Uh, so you have to send it somewhere. You have to give it to, to a third party. And that file lives under the protection of, of a DRM server. But once it needs to get out, it doesn't actually get out as is. It's getting encrypted or maybe probably using a wrapper. So it's not the, it's not the actual file. It's not the, the file itself that is being sent outside, it's it's that file plus something else with some policies uh, embedded on it. Now, it reaches the end party, uh, the third party, it reaches the end user. That end user, again, this is a business file. It, they need to actually use it. So what does that mean? It means that they need something on their machine. They need a technology on their endpoint that knows how to utilize this new type of file, read those policy, decrypt it, do a lot of things with it. So A, you might, you know, you might need to give your third party some sort of agent or tool to install and you have no control on their on their machine. This is not your own uh, company. It's not your own IT. And B, it's very, very limited. Uh, if we're being honest, when we're talking about enterprise DRM today, we are talking about office files, essentially, or PDF files. That those are the two kind of things. So, okay, great. You might have a solution for this file type, but there are other file types in the world. You need to do other things 
as part of your day-to-day -day business, what about that? Then you start having a problem and you don't actually have a solution today. We want to give a solution or we set out to give a solution that solves both of these things. You want to give you the granularity and the options to do whatever it is that you need to do for your business. Be completely agnostic and at the same time, do it completely agentless, requiring zero from the third party in order to work with your funds. And one last thing, and, and perhaps the most important thing, is that at the end of the day, let's assume we 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 you know we finish all the we went through all the hurdles, and now that third party user, that end user managed to get that file working on their computer. At that moment in time, the file, this very, very sensitive file, now lives inside a computer that is outside of your perimeter. You don't own it. You don't control it. It is now vulnerable. And so again, coming to our revolutionary solution, we wanted to come and say, what if that file doesn't ever have to leave your perimeter and your protection? And this is what we're giving. This is what we were able to create. Do you, how do you get around all those problems when you designed the, the KiteWorks Next Generation DRM? So essentially, um, you know, traditionally, you have, so we talked about encryption before. We have data in rest, right? We can encrypt the files uh, on, on the server where, where they live, you know, when they're not in use. In KiteWorks, we use double encryption, so they're, they're, they're encrypted both on the file level and on the disk level. We have the controls and services uh, to decide who can get access to the file, you know, all the policies that we discussed before and, and that Victoria is going to show uh, later on. And then we have the data in motion, again, very common usage, TLS 1.2 encryption, uh, actually, um, as of the as of the latest version of our product, it's it, we are also supporting TLS one point three. But again, the problem is with data in use, and this is what we solved. The way we solved it is now that instead of the file having to leave your perimeter and essentially out of your control, we have a solution where we provide um, a way for the end party user to view the file and work or edit the file via the browser without the file ever, ever having to leave your perimeter. So, you know, when we say data in motion, we obviously there is encryption for data in motion, but that motion is very, very limited. It does not leave. How do, how do we do that? We do that by using virtual uh, the virtual, virtualization technology and streaming technologies. Every time you want to do a safe edit, which is uh, how we call our, our revolutionary next, gen next generation EDRM solution, we, we create, we generate an on-demand disposable virtual machine running whatever application that you needed to run in the background. So it can be Microsoft Office, but at the same time, it can be solar winds, it can be video editing, it can be photo editing, it can be really whatever you want it to be. We load that file into that virtual machine and then we give virtual streaming access to that virtual machine via the browser. The so we're bringing the user into an isolated environment. We are not taking that file anywhere. That file stays within the perimeter allowing us to have complete control of the file. Nothing ever leaves the perimeter. Nothing is ever in danger. So just to, you know, you... A quick quick question for you, Yul, that came up. and You actually answered this, but it would be good to say it again. The question is, when will KiteWorks upgrade to TLS 1.3, which is a NIST SP 800-52 requirement? So the answer is we are. The, the latest version of the software supports Supports that. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, so just, you know, again, to, to very quickly recap or re-emphasis of what I just said, we, we provide you a way to create 
cust fully customizable. You own it, you control it. You can create a disposable virtual image running whatever operating system you want, running whatever um, ap editing application that you want on it. And on demand, when somebody who needs to do a safe edit, Kiteworks will create an instance of that virtual machine, load that file, load the, the file that we need to edit into that virtual environment, and then expose an encrypted video stream to the browser. Essentially, it's an interactive video stream. So it's on the one hand, we, we stream whatever is on the whatever is on the desktop of that environment to the browser, but we also stream the mouse and the keyboard back into the uh, virtual appliance giving the user the look, the feel, the experience of as if they were working on that application on their own machine. For, for the user, it's a completely seamless uh, experience and, and they, they can just work as they are used to working on their own files in their own, in their own machine. It, it's a, you will see later, there is absolutely no latency and it, it really feels very natural. Thanks, Yul. So Yul's covered how Kiteworks Next Generation DRM applies to Gartner's cryptographic element and identity element. Now, Victoria, can you explain how it applies Gartner's granular usage control element? Certainly. Yes, yeah, so while Yul's been really focused on this exciting new technology, I've been working with the team on how you know we effectively deliver this capability within the Kiteworks product. Um, so really, to, in order to manage that granular usage control within the product, what we've informed and built within Kiteworks is what we're referring to as a content-based risk policy. Um, so these risk policies that we have created as a function within the product is really Kiteworks' uh, way that we're allowing the application of the NIST cybersecurity framework to apply protection to content, <clears throat> excuse me, directly. <clears throat> Um, so what this capability provides to those who are managing, right, the risk and compliance that is needed around sensitive content, it really gives them a space to go ahead and identify, you know, what is that content that needs additional level of protect protection? Um, sorry, you can go back. Just listen. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> I'll wait for you to say next. <laughs> Got it. Um, and you know which user specifically will require more protection than not on which you know specific actions being taken on that content you know would require such protection all of this is being informed typically by a business need or maybe a regulatory uh, regulatory need as well um, so these policies are intended to be comprised of these components in order to inform what policy needs to be carried out within the product automatically. Uh, and by doing this, this allows, you know, the risk that otherwise is managed today currently by your end users who are using Kiteworks to share sensitive content. Now, really that compliance officer can kind of enact a level of control around that content to better manage the cyber risk for that content. Um, and as a result of these policies being in place, there's also a resulting audit log that will show, you know, that the compliance is, is truly intact. Uh, next slide. Um, so just to better understand what are these risk policies, I just wanted to really step through it. And again, you'll see a demo of this uh, here shortly by way of, of fuel. Um, but it starts with really identifying which content right, needs that level of additional protection. So the way we look at it is we look to identify it based off of some simple characteristics. You might happen to know where that content lives uh, on Kiteworks. Maybe it's in a specific folder path um, or perhaps it's certain file types, right? You might have all of your sensitive drawings, intellectual property that are held in CAD files it might be something worthwhile to hang a policy off of. Um, or if you've gone ahead and done the effort to go ahead and classify your content by way of MIP tags, Titus, et cetera, we'll also go ahead and read that tag as that content's moving through Kiteworks and be able to trigger policy based off of it. 
Um, so this is just a sampling as to you know some simple characteristics that we currently use to identify content. But simply put, we need to understand what content right, needs some additional protection. Uh, next slide. So here's just a, a quick a uh, screenshot really of what our policy builder looks like. So this is a policy builder that's available within our compliance console. So here uh, I am a compliance officer that is actually needing to go ahead and set up a risk policy. I have an M&A team as a part of our company and we are potentially acquiring a new company. So I need to go ahead and go in and put some additional protection around that folder for which I know collaboration communication is being carried out of. So I go ahead and create a new risk policy and I will go and identify that folder path for where all of these files are being kept related to this new um, prospect. Next slide. The next part of the policy is identifying those user conditions. So again, granular usage control. This is where you would wanna identify who specifically needs that additional level of protection, right? So certainly as a part of doing business, users and users need to collaborate, move content around, um, get what access is needed. Um, but maybe not all of them should have that full access and you need to certainly protect it in a slightly different way. Um, identifying which users right, require that protection is what this piece here does. So you can go ahead and identify you know, a subset of users that you particularly want to target this protection around. Uh, perhaps you're doing business with right, an external party and so you want to have a policy that's more broadly applied to that entire domain group. You can go ahead and, and carry that out as well. Um, some KiteWorks administrators, they go ahead and set up user profiles within the product to better manage those external parties or subgroups that they're working with, which helps them today uh, or prior, you know, be able to facilitate certain policies around security policies around those profiles. Now you can go ahead and do that with risk policies as well. Um, and something that I'm excited about that we are currently working on is perhaps having a location-based policy. So some regulations require, you know, that usage is generally okay, but you might require a different level of protection if the user happens to um, you know, access this content from a different country. Um, so again, these are all attributes of, of the user at the end of the day for which you're looking to identify, again, who you're looking to add some additional protection for. Next slide. So here, back to that example, um, the KiteWorks administrator within my organization has gone ahead and created profiles to manage those external users that we're working with. And so specifically for the you know, new company that we might be looking to acquire, we went ahead and created a profile for those users. And so here I am selecting that profile uh, as a part of the risk policy. Next slide. And then next is really identifying the action around the content. So within KiteWorks, there's a numerous amount of tasks and actions that can be taken on content. Content gets added, uh, sent, shared through KiteWorks. And if a user has access to that content, they can view, download, edit, right? They have a certain level of access to that content. And historically it's been defined by whichever end user kind of brought them into the environment. Um, that's a lot of control in your end user's hands. So here, um, we've taken a look at all those actions and we've tried to really boil them down into three. When you think about content moving, right? Content's getting added. You are granting access to that content when you add it to a folder, send it to somebody, share it with somebody. And then again, assuming someone has been given access to that content, now they have some capability to go ahead and do something with that content. Um, so these are our current actions that we're focused on, and then we are building appropriate restrictions off of those. Uh, next slide. Yeah. 
So the purpose of, you know, certainly our conversation here today really focused in on next gen DRM. Um, the focus we have is really protecting that access that a user has on the file, right? Again, access informs the viewing of the file, being able to download that file, edit it, et cetera. Um, so as a compliance officer who really wants to manage the collaboration that we're having with this new company, I wanna put in a policy that manages the access that those external users have to the content that's in this folder. Next slide. Um, so the last piece is really the, the level of protection. Um, so you've gone ahead and done the work to identify the content, the users, and the action that you care to protect. Now, what type of protection do you want to put in place? Um, we are focused again here today on safe edit. That is what we are referring to as our next gen DRM within the product. But we do have other you know, restrictions that are available. And really the intent here is they are different options depending on really the level of risk at which this combination <laughs> uh, really portrays to your business. Um, so certainly uh, KiteWorks has a, a pretty large footprint. Uh, and so our default policy is just to allow the action and tracking is happening as a result. Uh, again, that's our default policy as long as KiteWorks is being used. Um, some customers, right, you might just require to have, get a little more information from the user as to why they need to access the content. This information might just be needed for the purpose of audit. Uh, and so any collection of information that you get from the end user, we can go ahead and, you know, make sure that that is collected before they access the content. And all that information will be in your audit log uh, for proof later. Um, some customers want to have more manual oversight. So when certain content is sent or shared, they want to make sure that there's some uh, manual oversight by designated approvers. Uh, and so that's actually a current flow that we're, we're working on right now. Uh, you might want to uh, inform that if someone has access to the content, it's absolutely view only. And so that's our safe view capability. Uh, if someone needs to have full collaboration rights, be able to edit, make changes to that content, that's where you would want to trigger Save Edit. And that's what you'll demo here in a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, for the most sensitive uh, content, you might need to have some actions blocked. And so that's also why we allow to have a blocking restriction as well. Um, so just giving insight again to the variety that we have. Uh, and in all aspects of this content-based risk policy will continue to grow over time uh, in the next year or two. Next slide. So to finish out just you know, the build out of this, of this policy is I've gone ahead and I'm now selecting the restriction and setting it to safe edit. So setting up the policy is a one-time uh, need. And you can go ahead and turn this policy on in a reporting fashion so that you don't, you wouldn't, you know, inflict any change on business right away. You're able to kind of monitor it and see how the transactions show in the audit log to inform what would have been caught, right, by that policy, what would have triggered safe edit. Uh, we have that as a function when you go ahead and set up a policy. But once you're comfortable with, you know, turning that policy on, you turn it on and then KiteWorks is doing the rest of the work. Anytime that content is moved throughout KiteWorks, we are assessing if there's a policy in place in real time and then carrying out the restriction accordingly if it applies to that user that is indeed accessing the content at that time. Next slide. You can go through the pieces. Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, so here, just putting it all together, as the slide says, we created a single policy uh, and specifically, right, for my example, as a compliance officer who's needing to manage the risk around, you know, our future m and I have identified the folder is where all the content lives. And if any user from that external group goes ahead and tries to edit any content within that folder, they must edit it with safe edit is the policy. Next. 
Thanks, Victoria. Now, of course, these policies are only as good as the implementation, right? And it's not enough to be compliant. Everybody knows you have to be able to prove your compliance to the auditors. And that means you need an audit log, you need reporting. Can you say a few words about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, I mean, the audit log for Kyrix is um, really the backbone of our product. So it's, you know, unified, consolidated, and we have all the events, all the transactions happening in Kyrix being consolidated into this one audit log. Um, so that gives us a lot of capability to go ahead and surface reporting in many different ways. What you see here is a snapshot of what we've had for a little while now, CISO dashboard, um, where for any risk policy that you've defined, you can go ahead and filter your view of the transactions to that specific area, right? So if you've created a risk policy around, you know, like I did, MA data, or perhaps you have something in place for CUI, PHI, that kind of a thing, you can go ahead and filter this view here and be able to see how that picture changes and easily see, you know, especially globally, you know, what areas of the content are, are touching, um, touching that specific type of content. Um, so this is one option that we have. Next slide. Um, furthermore, we have, you know, our activity log that we've had uh, for a little while now, and we're continuing to build out new reports. So at the bottom here is an audit log, which is being built out specifically with the risk policies intent. Again, a one-time one, one, <laughs> one time, uh, spot to kind of go to and uh, select your risk policy and see all the transactions that have carried out around that content for a designated period of time. Um, this is really helpful, at least with, you know, what might need to be get pulled together for an auditor today when you're trying to show, right, proof of compliance around the handling of PHI data or PII, if you happen to have a GDPR, you know, compliance need. That's the intent with these reports is to give you all that information so you can see who's touching that content from where, when, and if there's a policy in place, it will be informing, right, that the appropriate policy was carried out um, here as well. That's it. Thanks, Victoria. So that's all great, but now you will, let's prove to the audience that we can really do this. Let's, uh, let's, yes, let's, let's do that. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Right, so this is, uh, for those of you who know, or those of you who don't know, this is this is Kiteworks. This is how the Kiteworks interface looks like, um, our, uh, or at least our, our, you know, our secure file sharing and collaboration platform. And this screen, this first place I wanna show you is, as, as, as it says in my title, my folder. So this is a folder that I, Yul, but I'm the owner of that folder. You can see that this is my, you know, this is my role on the folder here, which means I have unlimited access on this folder. I can do whatever I want with the files under these folders. I can edit these files. I can download these files. I can send them, delete them, remove them. Again, essentially whatever it is that I want to do with it. And that makes sense. It's my folder. Now, let's say that I'm a part of that uh, you know m a project that that Victoria has shown in in her slides so now there is this uh, folder right there's the folder called newco this is the, this is this project this is the company that we're looking into into acquiring and my profile the way I've been set up in kiteworks means that I'm in that profile that is you know that is a part of that policy that Victoria showed. So remember, we said that if for anybody, for, for this folder, for this new, anything under this new, new code folder, uh, for anybody who is under that profile, which I happen to be in, the only way they can edit things is by safe edit. And these, um, these policies that we are making supersedes anything else in Kiteworks. And which means now in this folder, before the folder, I was the owner. 
in this folder, I'm a manager of that folder. The, the only difference between a manager and an owner of a folder is that I cannot delete the folder. Otherwise, I, by right, I should have the exact same capabilities. I should be able to delete files. I should be able to download files. I should be able to do whatever I want with the files under this folder. However, the policy supersedes it. And now if I look at what I can do with this file, suddenly I can do very little with it. So it's, I don't know if you, it's very clear to see uh, with this Zoom uh, share, uh, screen share, but the download button is grayed out, it's disabled. I cannot copy the file, I cannot move the file. So I'm very limited in what I can do with the file itself. But most importantly, with editing, whatever capability, whatever editing capabilities I had before, it is now replaced with safe edit. And that is, that is the only uh, capability that I have, the only way I have now to edit this file. Now, re remember what I said about edit, the moment I click this file, uh, what happens right now, the moment I click this, uh, the edit button, I, Kiteworks is now generating, creating an instance of that virtual machine, that, that image that we talked about before, spinning up a Windows machine, spinning up Microsoft Office, loading that this Excel file into that office and, and streaming that back to me. Now it open, I now see that it opened in another window, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna drag that. So this is what it opened. Now you can see that this is my browser, right? This is, a, this is just my browser. This is, you know, this is the URL I'm working on, but Content-wise, this is Excel. It's not emulated. It's not, you know, looks like Excel. This is actual Excel running in a virtual machine in the backend inside the Kiteworks perimeter. And whatever I'm doing on the screen gets sent back. So when I click with my button with my mouse here, or when I type with my keyboard here, everything is working as if I was working directly on this application on my own computer. The latency is as close to zero as possible. Um, it knows who I am. So if I'm going to leave a new comment now, you can see that it knows my identity. I'm, this, is, this is the user that's working on. And more importantly, the moment I save this, the moment I click the save button, at this instant, this file, whatever changes I made, they just got saved back into Kiteworks. So real-time collaboration, real-time editing inside Kiteworks, the file never ever left my perim the perimeter, the Kiteworks perimeter, the, the, the file never ever reached the, you know, the third party, the end user. They cannot print it. They cannot save it locally. They cannot, you know, they cannot extract that information. They can copy paste from their machine to here, to the inside, but they cannot copy paste from the inside to the outside. Uh, also, again, maybe a bit hard to see on the stream, but there is a watermark display here. That watermark is displayed on the streaming layer. So it's not part of the file itself and it's also living. So every second yeah, you might be able to see that, you know, the timestamp changes uh, in, in real time. And that's it. I can do, I can let my end user do whatever they need to do. Once they're done, they save the file, they close it. And that's it. We're, we're done. The file is safe. The moment I ended that session, that virtual machine I just created before for these purposes is now in the process of being destroyed which means there, is no, there are no leftovers, there are no residuals, there is nothing. Complete and utter uh, cleanup, making sure nobody is able to touch the file unless they, are, they should be able to do it in the way we decided to, they need to be doing it in, under our protection, under our perimeter. And we, we kept full control of the file even while giving outside access to it. Now again, I showed you this demo with an Excel. I could just have easily shown you that demo with a, with, you know, with a CAD file or with a, with a photo file. We are 100% agnostic to what it is that is running on, the, on that Windows machine. I said it before, 
the Windows machine can be customized 100% to your needs and use whatever software that you want to use. That's it. That's the demo. It's, it's simple and yet powerful. Thanks, you. Um, I guess, yeah, we've got quite a few questions coming in. And those of you, if you have more questions to ask, just again, roll over the, the toolbar, you'll see the, the Q&A pop up and you can put your questions in there. But um, let's see, let's start with this one. What type of performance consideration, this is to you all, what type of performance considerations or stress testing has this undergone? I'd imagine the resource utilization to be higher with this new technology. Great question. Thank you. Um, so maybe before I answer that, uh, some maybe one explanation. Um, these Windows machines are full-fledged virtual machines, meaning they are not running you know, inside of KiteWorks. They are running parallel to KiteWorks. Uh, right now, we support either AWS or uh, VMware. In the future, we plan to support other cloud uh, solution providers as well, which means essentially now to answer your question, the, the bulk of the, the heavy lifting, as, it's, as it were, is not done by KiteWorks, it's done by whatever uh, virtual environment you choose to use. And how, you know, how, how fast is, are these machines is a question of how, you know, how powerful you make them, how much resources you give them in, let's say, AWS. Uh, in terms of the only, the only thing that KiteWorks itself, uh, the only load and uh, performance that KiteWorks is doing is handling all that, uh, you know, uh, streaming uh, transmission. So, in, uh, brokering between those virtual machines and the end user. And that we actually did do uh, stress testing, and we went up to as much as seven hundred and fifty concurrent sessions. So seven hundred and seven hundred and fifty different virtual machines running at the same time serving. 750 files at the same time and that the performance uh, hit was a, sing a low single, single digit. So anywhere between one to 5% uh, load in resources. Okay, um, let's see what's next here. So this one, this looks like one for Victoria. Do the new risk policies replace the policies on folders we have today? No, uh, they do not. So as Yul showed in his demo, right, he had existing policy uh, or an existing role on folders as manager, collaborator, et cetera, and it will augment their experience. So it will it will be the policy that trumps their experience, but it will not be a full replacement. This one looks like a Yule. If you did not save, would the collaboration party be able to see your changes in real time or would they see it after the save action? Right. Uh, so bottom line, they will only see it after the save action, but this really depends on, you know, the experience really depends on whatever uh, application you're using. Microsoft Office does not support autosave unless you are using their Office Office 365 capabilities, which for obvious reasons we are not. So Office does not support auto-saving. Uh, other solutions might, other applications might, sorry. And when you say obvious reasons, you mean because to use Office Online, you basically have to give the file to Microsoft. And uh, absolutely. Uh, so yeah. when we're when we're talking, maybe maybe it's important to say when we're talking to customers, when we're showing this to customers, or even before we show them, when we talked about we talk to them about what it is that they're trying to solve for, um, you know, many of them would say, I, "I'm not afraid of hackers uh, per se, right? I, I'm afraid of my file getting to the wrong hands of a Microsoft employee or a, or somebody from the government." Uh, serving a, a warrant to to Microsoft. I don't want my files getting anywhere near that, uh, you know, that Office 365 environment. I want it to stay completely within my control, and that's that's what we're giving them. Okay. And this looks like another Yule question. 
is DRM the same as IRM? <laughs> um, it's really it's it's there are a lot of definitions and a lot of of, of people calling different things in different names. Um, IRM is mostly, as far as I know at least, is mostly the term used by Microsoft uh, in their own IRM, DRM solutions. Uh, and it's very similar to what I what I showed before. So, you know, wrapping the file, wrapping the files or including extra information within files or to encrypt the files to make sure that they can only be opened by the authenticated user. But essentially at the end of the day, yes, it's the same thing. Okay. And then this one's for Victoria. Who controls the policies? Yeah, so for that, we have specific roles within KiteWorks, much like you have on the administrator side. We have a new platform called the Compliance Console where you can have designated users just have access to go ahead and manage these policies. Uh, and in addition to managing the policies, you can choose whether they have access to the audit log in addition or whether you want to keep those separate. So we're being, you know, at least in the beginning now, while we're introducing this new concept to our, our users or, um, is just allowing, you know, the roles to be distributed in whatever small way that they need to so that the right person has the right level of access that they need to perform their job. It's a, a repeat questioner. Thank you for the performance response. And now does the spinning up of VMs on AWS or VMware require additional licensing? And on that front, how is this new technology licensed in KiteWorks? Um, so there's a short answer and a long answer. The short, so on, a, on the AWS front or the VMware front, yeah, so it's not exactly not not uh, exactly a KiteWorks uh, license per se. It's an AWS license or a VMware license, um, but that's that you know that's something we can and should be worked out as part of your general deal. Uh, needs to be included with KiteWorks. Um, as for the licensing of Safe Edit itself, yes, Safe Edit is a premium feature that has its own license and requires a, that kind of attention. Yeah, and to be clear, the Safe Edit license from KiteWorks, it's, it, it, I don't want to say this, it's a limited number of seats. So say you've got a thousand seats in your overall KiteWorks license, but you only need 50 Safe Edit seats to work with your partners you can just license 50 people for for the safe edit license correct yeah exactly Thank okay you. all right um i think i think you answered this already i think this is victoria does this integrate with mips yes yes we will be able to trigger policy based off of any existing mip tags okay so all the data classification people have already done gets leveraged in these policies Exactly. Awesome. Okay. And oops, getting too many open windows here. Um, this is great though. Lots of questions just coming in multiple places. Um, yeah, and I think you already answered that one. Uh, oh, here's this one's name. Victoria, how do we test the policies? Yeah, so um, as as I mentioned, when you're going ahead and creating a, a risk policy, we have a few different statuses. So you can set it to a report only mode. That way you can set up a policy and run it in that mode for whatever length of time is comfortable to you. And what that will do is it will output an audit log for all the transactions that would have been you know, caught by that uh, policy. It will not trigger that restriction at that time, but you will see in the audit log the restriction that would have been applied. Um, so it allows you to kind of, again, assess, do a little bit of a smoke test before turning it on. Dry run. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, let's see, this one is Yule. Who creates the virtual images, KiteWorks or us customers? Um, so the answer is both. We provide uh, customers with a base image, 
with every all the you know all the software and tweaking that is required to to be safe edit compatible and then the customer gets that base image and, and then is able to customize it however they see fit install whatever they need to install uh, and so forth that being said uh, we are offering to do it together with the customer so we can help we can guide we can you know work together to make sure that this works as expected and you know everybody gets the, the best experience they need okay i think i guess this is a yule one also so this is a different licensing question how do we license the client software used in safe edit like i assume that's like the excel that you showed in your demo and how many of those licenses do we need um so a couple of couple of answers a couple of aspects to that question one is uh, to be clear, KiteWorks does not provide licenses to third-party applications. So Office or AutoCAD or whatever it is that, that you want to run there, we you also need to provide that license for that. We do have uh, strategies and recommendations on, on how to license that. Um, for Office specifically, we recommend using a generic user, a generic license. Uh, but that's something we can and we should discuss. So that's a part of the discussion where, when we do a, a safe edit deployment. It's a, it's a, that's part of the process, having that conversation. Okay. And would safe edit feature encourage users to use the platform as a file repository rather than safe file exchange? Would we have to plan to provision more storage space, I assume in Kiteworks, down the road? I don't see why. Um, so, like, like, I think it's very eloquently put as a safe file exchange. Uh, we, you know, just like we do today, uh, providing you know policies and the safe, safe exchange and safe access to files. This is just one more way to do that. Uh, there is there is no specific reason why you have to have those files stored on KiteWorks itself. Okay. Uh, let's see. And you answered this one. How many users can I have? Might have answered this. One. How bad is the latency? So I as well again, it's Zoom, so uh, a bit hard to to convey. But um, the the only the only uh, latency in air quotes is the time it takes to load that virtual machine. So again, a full fledged virtual machine it takes you know, 20 seconds to load uh, because that's how much it takes Windows to load. Uh, once it's there, once it's loaded, the latency is, is close to zero. It's all, as close to real time as you can get. Yeah, and certainly during the demo, we didn't see any latency. And exactly. I think you are, you're in a different continent than the system. Exactly, so I'm, I'm right now in Singapore, that system is running in the US and, and yet uh, no uh, no issues. Okay, so that that answers that question. Um, okay, I, I, I might even I might even say something else. Um, so I said, okay, I've, I've shown Excel here, but uh, just as easily I could have shown a, a video file, and we we, we did that, you, mm -hmm. you know, with 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 customers. Um, you know, it's not a perfect Netflix uh, experience, but it's. Again, as close to real time as we can get it. So latency is very, very small. Okay. And I mean, you showed this one in in your architecture explanation, but but uh, I think it's worth bringing up again. So there's this kind of a skeptic here. Seriously, exactly what set of applications do you support? No DRMs, <laughs> universal. Uh, so <laughs> uh, well. Again, <laughs> we we completely circumvented that question because our technology is not based on the application. We we live in the space between KiteWorks and the virtual machine. Whatever is running on on that virtual machine is completely none of our business. KiteWorks KiteWorks is is ignorant to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yes, it has to have a user interface, right? That's yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> We we stream okay. we again we stream the desktop whatever running on the desktop we'll stream it. Okay. Okay, and 
I believe that's all of our questions. So I, I want to thank everyone for attending, and I certainly want to thank our, our guests, Victoria and Yule. Obviously, they're they're very busy uh, with the you know the next set of features that are going into this. I think we've got another release planned in in May with a another tranche of of great features that are going to make this even stronger. So thank you everyone for attending and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.